Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Maria Elena Encapi, Executive Director of the National Immigration Law Center. Maria Elena has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Maria Elena, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mark. Great to be here. So immigration is a big topic nowadays. And you know, if you look at our people in America, we are a nation of immigrants, yet we have a very fraught relationship now with people who really resemble our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. Talk about the work of, of this organization at this time. Mm -hmm. The National Immigration Law Center has a very important role to play in the dialogue that is unfolding at this moment. Yes, I completely agree that this is, um, immigration is one of the defining issues of our times. And as an immigrant from Colombia myself, I arrived when I was three years old. My father was a guest worker. He was recruited from Colombia to work in the textile factories in Rhode Island. And the immigration laws were different in the 1970s. He was able to petition for my mother and my nine older siblings and myself to come to the United States. And so for me today, it's an honor to lead the National Immigration Law Center which is the only national legal organization that's exclusively, exclusively dedicated to low-income immigrants. And our vision basically and our mission is that today's uh, immigrant families and refugees should have the same rights and opportunities that previous generations of immigrants have had to be able to fulfill our full human potential and to help make this country the great country that it is. The thing that I don't quite understand is that when uh, your father came to the United States and then subsequently brought his family over. Unemployment was actually higher than it is today. There was arguably uh, less of a need at that time mm -hmm. uh, for immigrant labor than there is today where we have full employment and That's where right. we need people to take certain jobs. I'm not too sure where the difference is. How do you see it from your stance? as the yeah. executive director. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. I think one is, one it's what you mentioned at the outset, right, that in this country, everyone, unless you are indigenous and uh, Native American, we all have immigrant uh, backgrounds. And uh, the when my, when my family came, we were the beneficiaries of the civil rights movement. A lot of people don't realize that the civil rights movement not only led to civil rights for men, women, African Americans, et cetera, but also that 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 opened the doors for the 1965 Act, which did away with racial and national origin quotas for the first time. So we were among the beneficiaries of people from the Western Hemisphere and Africa and Asia that were able to migrate in the 70s at a time that the country was much more welcoming. And part of what we're dealing with today, Mark, is that there is a, um, a reckoning that's happening in the nation um, where there's a conversation about race, there's a conversation about a sense of scarcity, despite the fact that our economy is doing better than it has been since 2008. Um, and that, as you mentioned, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in recent times, yet there is an effort to use race by the current administration as a way to divide us, as a way to create more, um, uh, more of an us and them and uh, scapegoat immigrants. In terms of, of the work of, of the National Immigration Law Center, uh, talk about your programs and, and where the money goes that you uh, put together. Your, your budget is about $17 million. That is correct. Yeah, so we are focused, as I mentioned, our mission is dedicated exclusively to low-income immigrants and refugees, and we focus on a range of policies and laws that impact immigrants, and that is everything from immigrant access to health care and nutrition and safety net programs to workers' rights, education, and access to justice when to the courts. When you say you focus, what does that focus yes. mean? Yeah, so we use a, a combination of strategies, litigation, to defend against some of the worst attacks on immigrants. So for example, we sued, um, we filed the first lawsuit against the Muslim ban when that was first announced under this administration. We also have um, our lawsuit against um, the administration for terminating the DACA program, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, which basically protects young people who have been in the country since childhood um, from being deported. And they've had temporary protection from that deportation. And our case is, 
actually now one of nine cases that's headed up to the Supreme Court in the fall. Um, we also um, just recently filed a lawsuit um, to protect immigrant families, which is part of a campaign that we are co-leading um, against the, the new uh, public charge rule, which is a, a new racial wealth test that this administration has put in place, which out of all of the immigration changes that have been proposed under the current administration, this is the one that will have the deepest, widest, and long-lasting impact on the nation, estimated to impact about 26 million people. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a, 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 an interesting question. Let's say we were changing the, uh, the targets, and it wasn't Muslims that were being excluded. It was Buddhists, mm -hmm. or it was Hindus, or it was Christians, mm -hmm. or it was Jews. Let's say the, uh, the targets of these policies were not uh, people of color, but they were white people. Would you be taking the same positions? Oh, absolutely, because our organization represents immigrants of any nationality, any race, any immigration status. And so for us, it's really, our, is the person of low income? Um, does, this, does this issue impact low income immigrants? Is it going to create a barrier for these individuals to be able to fulfill their full potential and to contribute to making um, this country a great country as they also contribute to their families and to their local communities? What is your response to, um, to people who say, well, some of these rules are race neutral. It's about income level. Uh, it's about education level. It's about skills level. It's not about race, but it is about these other aspects. and and all people of all races, creeds, colors, national origins are going to be um, are going to be treated equally. It depends on what the issue is, right? I, I, as a lawyer, I would probably help do that analysis as well in, in assessing PACT. We, um, again, at the National Immigration Law Center, we've represented um, people of all nationalities, and so it, it isn't. It, it may not always be about race, but it, let's take the public charge issue as an example of that. So describe the public charge issue. Yeah, so the public charge is a definition that's actually been on our books since the 1880s. It was, cre it was put in the statute um, as part of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So from its roots, it was actually part Part of an exclusionary law. And um, despite the fact that it's been on the books, it's been defined and implemented in a very narrow way under both Republican and Democratic administrations. And the way that it's been implemented is that it says that if, if an immigrant is primarily dependent on certain public benefits for their subsistence, they could be considered a public charge and then would not be able to get a green card to remain in the United States. Um, that has been limited to if a person used Social Security income, SSI, cash assistance, or if they required long-term institutional care. And those were the two programs. And again, public charge has been on the books, it's been implemented. This new law suddenly radically changes the definition of public charge to include a much larger set of programs, including access to health care, to nutrition assistance, access to Section 8 and housing, et cetera. Um, and what the, the way that it is being, um, because of the, the larger context that we're living in and the level of fear that many immigrant communities are experiencing, there's a lot of confusion about who is impacted by this new rule and who isn't. But when you look at the statistics, if you look at the academic institutions and uh, nonpartisan think tanks that have analyzed who, which categories of people would be impacted by this, it is primarily com immigrants of color from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, um, which is one of the reasons that we talk about it as a racial wealth test. Now, now, it's important to couple the policy changes also with the rhetoric and the way that this is being talked about. So when this was being um, worked on at the White House, um, there was actually someone with strong white supremacist ties that event that was working on the, the definition of this public charge and making this change who has now been fired from the White House because that was exposed. Stephen Miller has made very, very clear that his intentions on this is for us to have a nation that is, or an immigration system that is limited to white and wealthier immigrants. And what we see with the Trump administration's final rule is that it's an end run around Congress. This is a change that only Congress can make, but this administration has try to do it through regulation. The definition of public charge is so vague that it could capture uh, pretty much any uh, help that you give to anyone Absolutely. in any way. 
The help can come from your own family. The help can come from a nonprofit that is privately funded. The help can come from a municipality that willingly supports certain programs for its own reasons. The help can come from a state or from a county. Um, the help can come from the federal government. The help can actually be, it is so vaguely defined that it, it creates this idea of if you live in a society in which you do not already have a certain level of income, the likelihood of your actually accessing that, that help is fairly high. And so you can end up having different people uh, create different definitions in different places uh, based on their own priorities. So all of a sudden you have law providing a framework for idiosyncratic enforcement. Mm -hmm. and, and the law is, is almost constructed to encourage that. Absolutely. Um, so then you have a elimination of social cohesion mm -hmm. because law no longer provides consistency law is actually used to provide inconsistency. Absolutely, and that's I think one of the cores of us, the, the, the tenet of our legal system is one of law and order, where you have consistency and uniformity. Exactly, and that is, you know, for a government that talks so much about law and order and the need for it, what we've seen is actually the complete opposite. It's chaos, it's inconsistency, it's fear, and, and, and with the public charge rule in particular, we've already seen the humanitarian impact. We've seen people who are not actually even directly impacted by it deciding affirmatively to voluntarily disenroll in health care. We have U.S. citizens who have basically said, I have family members who are a refugee, who have work authorization, who may be undocumented. I'd rather stop seeking chemotherapy because this may impact my family. We have U.S. citizens, US citizen children who are one or two or three weeks old whose mothers are saying, I don't want to receive any nutrition assistance for my child because I'm afraid that my child will be taken away from me or that I will be taken away from my child. And the, the, the issue is that these programs, Mark, one, as you mentioned, the law has been written so vaguely, it's 837 pages long. The idea or the notion that your average person in the United States states would be able to understand how does this 837 page rule apply to me or not is is just ludicrous. Well also when you want to scraggle an issue it takes 830 pages. To, that is correct. To that, it. That's correct. And um, the, but the issue is that the, the fear is real and it's already having a humanitarian impact and these are programs that are anti-poverty programs that have been successful for decades in our nation and they're programs that the majority of Americans will use at some point in their life. Time. Thank you so much for unfolding this amazing work of the National Immigration Law Center and how you are evolving your, your programs. Thank you so much for your leadership and thank you so much, Maria Elena, for your insights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark.